Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Aloha and welcome to Hawaii Together on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. I'm Kili'i Akina and today we're going to talk about a measure that will be on the Hawaii ballot on November the 6th, 2018, during our general election. It's an important measure from the point of view that it deals with education, and yet it may not be everything that meets the eye. Today we've got two people who actually have studied it very carefully and are deeply concerned about it and want to communicate to the public that we've got to be very, very careful. My guests today are old friends, and I'm so glad to have them here. Randy Roth needs no introduction. He's a true public intellectual. He's someone who has been in the academic world at the University University of Hawaii Law School and retired, but has also been involved in public policy and has been, in a sense, a legal watchdog for the state of Hawaii. My other guest is Stanley Lau, someone who's been an up-and-coming entrepreneur who operates a business that employs people here in the state of Hawaii, and he cares deeply about his employees as well as the consumers here in the state. Please welcome to the program Randy Roth and Stan Lau. Randy, welcome to the program. Thank you much. Good to have you. Stan? Thanks for having me on the show. Thanks so much. You know, right at the outset, let me ask you this question. I'm going to start with Stan here. You're a businessman. You've got food to put on the table for your lovely family. Mm -hmm. You've got a lot of employees and so forth. But you're taking off huge amounts of your time right now to get involved in a public policy matter, a ballot measure. Why are you doing that? It's one of the biggest concerns that I have as a, like you mentioned, a father of a young family and um, having spent time on the mainland, one of the concerns is, uh, sp especially moving back to Hawaii, with the cost of living here, how can we as a young family and others um, in a similar situation continue to stay here, um, to thrive here? And I think that's a big concern. Um, I'm sure there are a lot of people who've had thoughts of moving away to the mainland. And with a, with a measure, or a proposed constitutional amendment stated this way, I think one of our concerns is we already have such a high burden in terms of taxing and um, cost of goods, homes. What can we do to make sure that people here can continue to stay here? So we're going to get into the details of that later on, but you obviously feel that if this measure is passed, it's going to be bad for the consumers here in the state and maybe bad for the very people it's intended to help, the teachers and the children. Let me ask Randy. You know, you're basking in your retirement. <laughs> You've had a wonderful career. I've discovered that I'm very good at retirement. <laughs> and yet you've been passionate about this ballot measure called the CONAM, the Constitutional Amendment. What drives you to get back into the fray? Uh, several things. My background includes tax policy, and I've been on the State Tax Review Commission, and I care about the integrity of our tax structure. And I think this proposal would be very bad from that standpoint. But more importantly, I've worked very hard for a long time, 27 years, uh, as an advocate for public education in Hawaii. And I think there are major problems with public education as a system in Hawaii right now. Unfortunately, I think this constitutional amendment issue is, is a real distraction. On its face, it's all about helping public education, but I think that's just a facade. And I think that if it were to pass, it would actually be disadvantageous to public uh, education. And I, I hope to explain why I feel that way a little bit. Well, we will definitely hear from you on that. Maybe you could help me out at the very beginning here. Let's take a look at the actual ballot measure that will be voted upon by Hawaii's voters on November the 6th. 2018. From my understanding, it's very short, very simple. It says that the legislature, if it is passed, would be allowed to add a surcharge to property taxes for the sake of education. Is that basically it? That's basically it. It doesn't use the word tax. Obviously, we're talking about the authority for the state to tax real property. Well, let's just um, but you're absolutely right. pause there for a moment, because it does talk about place, placing a surcharge on property, but uh, property taxes that would be there. But you, you're saying this is actually a tax? What is a tax? <laughs> well, a tax is, is a forced exception. OK, so that's the key. Uh, to where property owners have no choice. They're given a bill. Uh, currently in Hawaii, we have real property taxation, but it's done by the counties. And so um, somebody like me who cares about the system, we like that there's political accountability, that if taxpayers think that there's no need for an increase in real property taxes, 
but the counties increase real property taxes, the taxpayers know who to hold accountable. And accountability is critically important in a representative democracy like we have. But once the state also has the authority to tax real property so that some of that bills because of what the county's doing, some of what the state's doing, you lessen political accountability. It makes it harder for taxpayers to hold anyone accountable. So one of the concerns you have is that we're taking power away from the counties, which is the most local level at which we can hold people accountable in terms of political power, and we're giving it to the state. We're allowing the state to dip its hand into the pot that really the counties have. And, and it's even worse than that. Not only do you lessen political accountability, mm -hmm. But this would immediately adversely impact the counties because their bond ratings would go down. The bond rating agencies right now, they say, you know what, when the county wants to borrow money to put in new water lines or sewers or what have you, we're pretty confident that they can tap the public, they can raise real property taxes as necessary. So the bond rating is really quite good. The interest that the counties have to pay is really quite low. But once the state has authority to start imposing real property taxes, the bond rating agencies are over here saying, wait a minute, now it's anything but a given that the counties are going to have room, if you will, to increase taxes in order to pay sure. for some bonds. And so the bond rating would change immediately, would hurt the counties, and slowly but surely the counties would find it harder and harder and harder to pay for the basic services that they provide, police, fire, et cetera. So what you're saying basically is that there would be unintended consequences, things that don't appear on the surface when you mark your ballot on the polls, but ultimately could hurt our economy, and, and not only our economy, but the very teachers and the keiki that are purportedly the ones that are, are going to be helped. Let me ask well, Stan. Let, let me just add that unintended consequences obviously can be very bad just in and of themselves, but this would be predictable, predictable negative unintended consequence. So whether it's intended or not isn't the issue. We can see if this passes sooner or later, it's going to have a major impact on the counties and it would start to have an impact right off the bat because of how the bond sure. rating agency In other words, is. It's, it's not just a far-fetched interpretation you're making. You're saying you do this action, you're going to get this consequence. If I drop a rock, it's pretty sure it's going <laughs> to head toward the We'd earth. have to close our eyes, which is part of the problem. Stan, some of those unintended consequences translate into problems for everyday residents, many of whom are renters in our state. Mm -hmm. uh, how does that affect you as a business owner? So we, our business took an informal poll and about 75% of our employees rent. A lot of them rent uh, walk-up apartments that are easily over a million dollars. Currently, there is no threshold. The HSTA um, purports that there's a $1 million threshold. And even if that existed, we'd, we'd find that in running some of the studies for internally of what this would cost us as a business, we see that those employees, their, uh, their rents will go up because as a, as a, a homeowner or landlord, um, they're, they're gonna pass that on. I, we, can, we can expect that to happen. And Stan, so, you know a lot of teachers as well. Uh, are many teachers renters? I, I, can't, I don't have any statistics mm -hmm. on that, but I can imagine that there are teachers who rent, uh, especially if you're, if you're starting out. Um, you know, it, that wouldn't be out of the question. I think there are teachers who rent. And even homeowners, you had mentioned something earlier that there, there is a million dollar threshold that is mentioned. In other words, th th this would only be a quote unquote tax upon people who have that extra million dollar property. But that's, that's not really in the measure, is it? I didn't see it written in no, the not at measure. All. That's not on the ballot and that will not be on the ballot. You know, that, that brings us to some of the techniques, if we will, that are being used to promote this measure. One is to say we can trust our legislature because their intention is only to tax people who are very wealthy. What do you think about that, Randy? Uh, I think it's real clear what the language says. And even if the legislature had an unwritten intent, uh, history tells us that sooner or later, with a new taxing authority, uh, they're going to use it. And to the extent they can broaden who it applies to, they're going to broaden it. You know, when I was describing the language earlier, I said a tax on real property. Viewers might say, wait a minute, wait a minute, it says investment real property. Well, the word investment doesn't limit what the state could tax 
in any way. When somebody buys their own home and lives in their home, that's an investment. And I'm not stretching the word to get there. You've got probably your biggest investment in your that's home. It. So the way it's written, never mind what somebody may have intended, the way it's written and the way future legislators will look at it is that the state could impose any, ta any rate of tax on any real property, including owner-occupied homes, with no thresholds whatsoever. And that's very different than what the proponents are describing. But I'm just telling you what's there in writing and the history is if the state has the authority to tax a lot of people, sooner or later they're going to tax a lot of people. In other words, what you're pointing out is that in addition to renters who will be impacted terribly by this, it would also be homeowners of average middle class homes. A million dollars is a fairly moderate home here in the state of Hawaii, and it's possible that just the average homeowner will be hit. You just think about it, if they started out just taxing rental properties mm -hmm. so it only adversely affected renters, people would say, wait a minute, that's not fair. Why would rich people who can afford to own their own home not have to pay this additional amount, where less rich people who are over here renting are going to have to pay it because it's going to be passed on by the landlords, as you indicated. So sooner or later, if this were to pass, I'm pretty confident it would be broadened out to affect every owner of real property and people who rent from owners of real property. What you're saying is that we would be giving the legislature a blank check to expand those to who are affected by this. I wouldn't call it a blank check. I'd call it a blank check book or a box of blank <laughs> check books because every year, year after year, they would be using it. And the last two tax review commissions have said to the legislature, you're going to have to raise a lot more revenue and cut spending because of the $25 million, billion dollars of unfunded liabilities, things that have already happened in the past that haven't yet been paid for. So if you're saying, oh, the legislature would never go after homeowners, the tax review commissions have looked at this and said they have to cut spending and increase revenues if they're going to balance the books going forward. Well, obviously, then, those who are making the argument for it uh, are, are basing their, their, con, their case on what the legislature might do or might not do, but voters are not going to have that guarantee in front of them. There's one other thing. Stan, this may impact you because you have young keiki, but this, is, we're told, is for the keiki. Mm -hmm. And very often, that is the most powerful language that is used. What do you think about that as an argument? Wow. Don't you, Les Stan, love the keiki? Absolutely. I, I have young children that are in the public school system. And I think one of the concerns that I have is really, if you look at, on the surface, what this constitutional amendment is about, it's not necessarily just about teachers and, and keiki. Right? There are no guarantees that the money will actually end up being um, diverted to an educational fund without any kind of um, back out of what the state is currently funding in the DOE. I think that's one of the concerns, that there would be no net gain from this tax to the kids. But if we take a couple steps further back, is I think one thing that people don't really think about is that this is a constitutional amendment. It is something that we are voting for to fundamentally alter our state's constitution. And I know uh, there are a couple ways that this can be done, but this is something that would, if passed, will be something that will be very hard to remove or to take away. Well, those are some real concerns that we're going to come back to and amplify in just a moment. My guests today are Stanley Lau and Randall Roth, and we're talking a bit about what is not really there that meets the eye in this constitutional amendment that is being proposed at the upcoming uh, elections. Don't go away. We'll be right back on Think Tech Hawaii's Hawaii Together in just a moment. Think Tech Hawaii. 日本語で
and aloha. My name is Calvin Griffin, the host of Hawaii in Uniform. And every Friday at 11 o'clock here on Think Tech Hawaii, we bring you the latest in what's happening within the military community. And we also invite all your response to things that's happening here. For those of you who haven't seen the program before, again, we invite your participation. We're here to give information, not disinformation. And we always enjoy response from the public. But join us here, Hawaii in uniform, Fridays, 11 a.m., here on Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha. Welcome back to Hawaii Together on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. I'm Kelee Akina, and you can see this program on thinktechhawaii.com. I hope you'll watch it and send it to some friends because it's very informative. Now, back to Randy Roth and Stanley Lau as we're talking about the ballot measure coming up on November 6, 2018 called CONAM, the Constitutional Amendment that would allow legislature, legislators in our state to actually take funds from real property to use purportedly for education. Now, Randy, that whole concept has an understated premise, which is simply this. The problem with our schools is a lack of money. We need to go out and get more money and throw it at that problem. What is your assessment of that? I think um, there is a crisis of sorts with public education in Hawaii. I think there are, are some glaring problems. Um, the National Assessment of Education Progress, the NAEP, the Nation Scorecard, put us, once you adjust it for demographic factors, which the experts say you need to do in order to have a fair comparison, uh, we're last in the nation in every category. Fourth grade reading, fourth grade math, eighth grade reading, eighth grade math, last in, in the nation. So doesn't that make the case that we just need to put more money out there in order to get a higher ranking? Or are you suggesting that money is not the problem? I'm a proponent of public education, and I'm never going to argue against more money. What's been proposed, I think, wouldn't result in more money going there. But to understand the situation, you begin to say, well, what is our current level of, of funding? On a per pupil basis, which is the only way to make sense out of how we compare to other places, um, the last year that we have data that can be compared to other states is two years ago. And we're spending on operations alone about $14,000 per student. Mm -hmm. That's the 15th highest in the nation. So. Is that adequate or inadequate? The question isn't answered by that, but we're toward the top. We're 15th in, in the nation. The dollar amount is 17% higher than the mainland average on a per pupil basis. Is 17% above the mainland average enough? Opinions will differ. According to the U.S. Commerce Department, the cost of living in Hawaii statewide, it's higher on Oahu, but statewide, and we have a statewide Department of Education, the cost of living is 18.4% higher than the average on the mainland. So if our per pupil expenditures put us at 15th in the nation, and they amount to 17% above the mainland average, and the cost of living statewide in Hawaii is only 18.4% more than on the mainland. I'm not arguing that the current funding is sufficient. I'm simply saying there's a real issue as to whether the legislature has really provided what they think is adequate uh, or not. I believe what they've been providing reflects their opinion of whether more money to the DOE would be wasted or not. I think they view this DOE as a bucket filled with holes, and they're hesitant to put money into that bucket that's going to go through holes. In other words, not be used effectively. I believe strongly what the governor's been saying now for nearly four years, and the current school board chair's been saying for quite a while, and I'm told the superintendent is saying, we need to radically change this top-down, overly centralized, bureaucratic Department of Education into a school-centered or school-empowered system. And it's doable. It's not a silver bullet. It wouldn't happen quickly. It wouldn't be easy. But it's an initial, essential first step toward having a system where teachers will decide what the priorities sure. are, where teachers will have some control over who their principal is, where teachers will have 
that flexibility to focus on the kids that they don't have now. And that's what it's all about, is creating a system that supports teachers so that they've got the freedom, they've got the resources, and they've got the encouragement okay, to focus well, on the kids. That's quite a comprehensive overview. <laughs> in, in short, you're saying that even if we raise money with this constitutional amendment, when we put it into the DOE, we have no assurance whatsoever that it's actually going to result in a better system. Because what we really need is to change the system that we already have. Right. And you've suggested some of the measures by which that's And, and let me just say, if, if this passed, and, and even mm -hmm. if more money went into public education, and like I say, I think money is green. I think if more were coming in from a special fund from the new tax, they would just allocate fewer general funds. So I don't think it would really increase uh, the money. Uh, but even if it did, we've got a system that is, is dysfunctional. It's not the people, it's, it's the structure. And you've got to change that structure. And then when you're beginning with the teacher's priorities, and that's what's driving this whole thing, to the extent that it turns out that the current level of funding isn't sufficient to do what we as a people want our public education to do, then we can support it. See, one thing I can guarantee is that if this CONAM passes, it's not going to change the legislature's priorities. And so if the priorities next year are the same that they are this year, they're not going to want to put money into the DOE, more money into the DOE, any more next year than they do this year. Right. So you've it's, got it's, to get them to look at the DOE as having changed to where it would be a good investment. And I'm afraid this CONAM is simply distracting from the issue that really needs attention, and that is transforming the Department of Education the way the governor has said, the school board chair has said, I'm told the superintendent has said, the public needs to support that. And with the focus on this CONAM, it's like that's being lost. So the constitutional mm -hmm. amendment is really the wrong medicine. We need a different fix altogether, and that fix is available even without this draconian measure. Now, Stan, you represent a group of community leaders and business people who've come together. What's the name of the organization? The Affordable Hawaii Coalition. And, and what is the basic aim of this group? Well, so the basic aim is really to educate the public about the downfalls and why this is bad policy, why this CONAM is so bad for the public. And I'll be honest, when I first read the measure, even being a part of the AHC, I thought this was a great idea. But it's not until looking at it further, what is, what is a surcharge, what is being imposed, what is being taxed, where is the money going, that you start to realize that there are so many holes with the language and what is being proposed that, like Randy said, what is an investment? What is investment property? What is qualified? Is it my primary home, which like Randy said, that's the largest investment that most people make. Well, we talked it's, earlier about the fact that what is touted is the fact that it's f supposedly for the keiki, for the teachers. So on an emotional level, it's very hard to stand against. But do you think people are starting to get the message that we have to really think about the, this? It can't be a case of the ends justifying the means. Uh, ab absolutely. And, and, you know, for people who say, you know, I, I want teachers to make more money. You know, right now we've got uh, some real shortages in certain areas, primarily in special education and in certain rural areas and some high school specialty classes, math and physics and, and that sort of thing. But what HSTA, the teachers union in effect says, is let's pay everybody more and let's um, Let's not distinguish between those teachers who are doing an especially good job, on the one hand, and these other teachers that wouldn't have a job except the union contract requires principals to take them if they want to work at that school. Um, the whole structure is that the, D, the HSTA, in terms of how it focuses on protecting the weakest teachers as opposed to providing added value to what the, the vast majority of teachers are doing is as broken, I think, as is the governance structure of the Department of Education. So what you're talking about is that we are looking at a case where the union may not be able to help the members of the union as well as it used to in the past. The union could be out of touch with union members. This has been a, a tough year for the union in some senses. Recently there was a decision at the United States Supreme Court called the Janus versus the AFSCME, in which uh, 
unions were basically told, no, they, they can't uh, just take union dues out of the, the paychecks of workers. What, what, what do you think this portends for union responsiveness to its members? Yeah, public sector unions, and right now we're talking about the teachers union, mm -hmm. uh, whether they like it or not, are going to have to change a lot. Uh, the Department of Education, the governance structure has to be transformed, but it has to be transformed in order for the system to get better. The teachers union, to survive, is going to have to radically alter how they approach things because in the past, they could count on union dues or agency fees. Now, because of the Supreme Court decision you mentioned, sooner or later, their members are going to figure out that giving anything to the union, whether you call it agency fees, you call it union dues, giving anything to the union is like going to church and putting money in the collection basket. You do it if you want to, and the amount you put in is what you want to put in. Frankly, the public sector unions in Hawaii, I think, have not been honest with their members yet. And I think sooner or later, they're going to have to be. There's a law in Hawaii right now that basically says the workers only have a limited period of time once a year in order to, to try to get out of paying union dues. And then it's a process where they're, in effect, going to be shamed by other people. The law of the land, now that that Janus decision has been made, is that at any moment, this afternoon, if they want to call up their union and say, I'm not going to pay any more money, then the union cannot take another penny of their money. And once the members get it, the unions, and now we're talking about the teachers union, are going to have to figure out how do I add value? How does the union add value to these teachers in a way that they appreciate so much that they contribute, that they continue to give us a thousand dollars a year sure. or whatever well, the union it, it, it would seem that we've come to a time when the, the general public, the voting public, as well as union members, can send a strong message to union leaders as to what they want in Hawaii, and that's what this ballot initiative is all about. And the teachers mm -hmm. union is in a difficult position. On the one hand, they're saying we're doing a great job for our members. On the other hand, they're saying that public education and teacher pay has been grossly below what is, you know, what it should be for for decades. Well, how can the teachers union both have been doing a good job and funding a teacher pay be you know, sure. ridiculously low? There's, there's something not quite squaring in we that. We have to put two situation. and two together, so mm -hmm. to speak. There well, you go. I want to say thank you for being on the program today, Randy. You've added a lot of good insights to this issue. Thank you, Kali. And thank you so much uh, as well, Stan. Thank you. We're going to wrap up right now, and I hope that you've heard from two gentlemen who've really studied the matter that there's really a great deal of concern about this CONAM measure, and it's important to tell people this isn't necessarily going to help the teachers at all. In fact, it actually may hurt teachers and cakey as it raises rents, as it raises the cost of being a homeowner, as it damages the economy, and more than that, as it gives incredible power to the state government to come in and, and do something that may damage the role of the counties. If this concerns you, stay informed and to get a hold of, let me ask Stan again, the name of the organization and? The Affordable Hawaii Coalition, and we have a website at affordablehawaii.org. Well, very good. I'm Kili Akina, and this is Think Tech Hawaii's Hawaii Together. Until next time, aloha.